I'm Chris Fitzgerald, and thanks for tuning into the Jazz Bass Technique Series. In the last installment, entitled Thumb Position Technique Basics, we examined a lot of the mechanics needed to get a player started actually producing sound in thumb position. Things like how to place your thumb on the string, various hand orientations, including fixed position versus free position, curved fingers versus collapsed fingers, etc. In this installment, I'd like to focus on the musical applications of those techniques and introduce some things like three different scale fingerings and positions that can be played in thumb position, and then how to apply those three scale positions to the playing of melodies and basic diatonic soloing up in thumb position. And then towards the end of the video, we'll look at ways to add in chromatic notes to those basic positions so the player will have the full chromatic scale at their disposal when they improvise. So having said that, let's get started. Well, before we can move forward and examine the three scale positions and three scale fingerings, which will facilitate all the music in the rest of the video, there's still one technical aspect that we need to cover, and that is the three hand orientations needed to play those three scale positions and three scale fingerings. And these hand orientations were alluded to by a great uh, double bass pedagogue named Petraki in a book called Simplified Higher Technique which is a book about thumb position, really wonderful book about thumb position, which many classical bassists study. And in this book, he describes three ways in which the hand is oriented, the left hand is oriented, which facilitates most of thumb position playing. And those three ways are chromatic position, semi-chromatic position, and diatonic position. And I'd like to cover those really quickly here so we can move on uh, to examining the scales and then the music making that they enable. We actually referred to chromatic position in the last video. So we started, we played the D harmonic, we put our thumb on the D. Chromatic position is the position where you have a half step between your fingers. And so it's just half step, half step, half step, half step. Um, musically speaking, uh, this is easy to remember because it sounds like the Th Thelonious Monk composition called Blue Monk. So it's just half step between the fingers. And of course, anytime you practice one of these techniques, you should practice it on each string so you get used to how it feels. How it feels on each string, and also how to play it in tune, because the way that you shape and space your fingers has a lot to do with intonation. It's not all ear-based, although a healthy portion of it is. So chromatic position sounds like Blue Monk and is just a half step between the fingers. The next orientation is called semi-chromatic position. So if we find that, find that same D, in semi-chromatic position, there is a whole step between the thumb and the first finger. And continuing our Monk theme, Semi-chromatic position sounds like the monk composition Straight No Chaser, which begins like this. So in semi-chromatic position, these three fingers are still, the fingers one, two, and three, are still a half step apart, but there is a whole step between the thumb and the index finger, which is really no problem for the hand since the thumb moves independently. So, so far we have chromatic position, just half steps, blue monk, semi-chromatic position with a whole step between the thumb and the first finger, straight note chaser. The third position that Petraki describes is a little less common, um, but it is used often enough that it, it really benefits us to know it and it will be used in one of the, uh, the scale positions that we'll examine later. And this is called diatonic position. Now diatonic position is a little bit awkward for the hand because diatonic position has a whole step between the thumb and the first finger, another whole step between the first finger and the second finger, and then a half step between the second finger and the third finger. He calls it diatonic position because it sounds like the last four notes of a diatonic scale, scale degrees 5, 6, 7, and 8 of a diatonic scale. And this one's easy to remember musically, not for a 
because it relates to a Thelonious Monk composition, but because it sounds like uh, the theme from the old Adams Family TV show, which begins with exactly that sound. If you know that theme, you'll never forget it. If you don't know that theme, check it out, you, then you'll never forget it. So diatonic position is simply whole step, whole step, half step. Now physically speaking, the diatonic position is a little awkward because of this whole step between the first finger and the second finger. Our fingers are much more comfortable being a half step apart, whether down in, in the lower positions or up in thumb position. So this is, it's much more difficult to, to play this with good intonation because of this whole step between one and two. So sometimes players will play this diatonic position without that whole step there. And they'll just do a pivot on the third finger in order to reach that last note. But the way Petrachi described it, it was thumb, whole step up to one, whole step up to two, half step up to three. So we've now covered the three basic hand orientations needed to play the scales that we're going to be looking at in a moment. Chromatic position, which is blue monk. Semi-chromatic position, which is straight note chaser. And diatonic position, which sounds kind of like the Adams Family theme. Take some time to practice each of these hand positions on each string. Get used to the way that they feel. Get used to what, what your hand has to do to play them in tune. And then we'll be able to apply them to the scale positions, which will enable us to make a whole lot of music in the next section. Well, now that we've covered the three hand orientations, we can move on to the three scale positions, which will facilitate so much music making in thumb position. And I've divided those three scale positions into what I call type one, type two, and type three scales. And the reason why there are three scale positions is because when you improvise, um, you never really know where you're going to end up on what finger on uh, in what position because you're kind of making it up as you go along. So it's very useful when improvising to be able to start a scale, especially a major scale, um, from any finger of your hand. And these three positions will allow us to do that, which means that no matter where we find ourselves on the bass, we'll be able to play a sound um, from whatever position that is. So to start with the first position, it's the, I call it the type one position on the handout. Um, it is a chromatic position and it's the easiest scale position of all. We actually covered it at the end of the last video. And I'll put that, um, I'll put the screenshot of that position at the bottom of the screen. But if you have trouble seeing it on the video, it's not a problem. The PDF of the entire handout will be available on my website. Um, once the video is finished, so you'll be able to download that and look at it uh, in person rather than on the screen. So the, the, the way that the scale positions are going to be described, they're going to be uh, drawn on the, on the graphic as though you were playing them on a bass guitar. Now that we actually have four fingers to play with in thumb position, we can actually cover a chromatic scale very easily. Um, so what you'll be looking at is, is the scales written as though they were on a bass guitar and you'll see imaginary frets there and they're just showing us where our fingers would be uh, in order to play in that particular position. So the type 1 scale position basically if we go and we put our thumb on that D harmonic and drop it down so it's going to be playing the harmonics A and D so we put our thumb on the harmonics and the B flat scale will basically be the type one, the chromatic position scale will actually be this. So we're in chromatic position. We don't have to have any spacing between any uh, wider spacing between our thumb and our first finger. And the scale itself, the B flat scale in this case will be basically one, three, thumb one, three, thumb two, three. And if you notice on the, on the graphic, 
there's also some notes in parentheses below that and that shows notes that you can reach from that position down below or in some cases above um, the octave of the scale that we're playing so the B flat scale from root to octave is basically this but we can also reach notes below that in this position so we have root seventh sixth and fifth so as we're learning these scales, it's incredibly important for us not to just think of them as positions that our hand plays in, but also positions where our ear and our hand connect with each other. So in this case, we want to be thinking not only first finger, third finger, thumb, first finger, third finger, thumb, second finger, third finger. That's something we want to memorize very quickly, but we also want to be thinking in terms of the degrees of the scale that we're playing because this will facilitate uh, playing melodies in any key and will also facilitate improvisation in any key. So as we play these scales, in addition to the fingerings which we just talked about, we should also be thinking about scale degrees. So we can think about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight being the same as one, the octave. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So one of the things that would be really useful to do as we practice this position, uh, obviously in this uh, installment of the series, we're focusing on the, the song My Romance, and there will be several uh, improvisations on My Romance later in the video. But the melody of My Romance, which is also included in the PDF, basically goes like this. And I'm going to describe it in terms of scale degrees as though I were singing it rather than in terms of note names. So it would be 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 5, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 5, 4, 5, etc. It's really strange to try and put it into words, but most improvisers I know um, when they're improvising, they're not thinking of the names of the notes that they're playing. If anything, uh, most of them are just hearing sounds and playing those sounds because they've ingrained all of the other information from so many thousands of hours of practice. But if they're thinking anything at all, they're probably thinking in terms of the sound of a scale degree within a tonal center. And so when we play melodies, it's great to read it note by note, and that's a, that's a beginning step. But when we get beyond that step, we want to be thinking in terms of how does this correlate in terms of scale degrees. So my romance, opening phrase, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 5, etc. So that's a type 1 scale position. Completely chromatic, a uh, chromatic position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Moving on to the type 2 scale position. The type 2 scale position is a semi-chromatic scale position. And as we described in the last segment, we've got our thumb on the harmonic. So our thumb will be on uh, the A. And we're going to play an A major scale this time. And we're going to play my romance in A major, but it's not a big deal because of the way that we'll think of it. The semi-chromatic position then for a major scale beginning on the thumb type 2, what I've called on the handout as a type 2, is thumb, 1, 3, thumb, 1, 3, and now I'm going to shift the thumb up by a half step so I can play thumb, 1. So again, thumb, 1, 3, thumb, 1, 3, thumb, 1. Notice on the handout it also shows that you can reach the second or ninth degree of the scale above it. And you can also reach root seventh, sixth, and fifth below if you like. In terms of scale degrees, this type two position, which is semi-chromatic with a slight shift of the thumb at the top, in terms of scale degrees, it sounds one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So if we were to play the opening phrase to my romance or any melody in a in a major key, um, we would just need to play the same scale degrees, but out of this position. 
three, four, five, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, seven, six, five. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Etc. And that's the way that we connect our ear and our hands together for improvisation purposes. So we don't have to think about the name of each note. We're really thinking about the function of each note in a tonality, just as if we were singing. So the type two position, semi-chromatic, with a slight pivot or shift of the thumb on the top string. The third position, what I call a type three position, is the one that I probably use the least but it's still very, very useful in a lot of ways. Still with our thumb on the A, this time the first note of the scale will be a C, and I'm playing that, in this case, with the second finger. So I'm going to play second, uh, second finger, thumb, first finger, second finger, thumb, first finger, second finger, third finger. So you notice that this type 3 position is a combination of semi-chromatic and diatonic position. Semi-chromatic at the bottom, because I have a whole step between my thumb and my first finger. So we start. And semi-chromatic. And when we get to the top string, then we're in diatonic position. This one is a combination, obviously, of, of semi-chromatic and diatonic positions in terms of scale degrees. The same thing applies. We're thinking uh, scale degree 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So if we were playing My Romance um, in this position, in terms of scale degrees, we would do the same thing. 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8. 7, 6, 5, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6, 5, 4, 5. This scale position is a little bit more complicated because it combines semi-chromatic and diatonic. And of course the top, the top could be played with that pivot on the third finger as well as we described in the last segment. If your hand prefers that orientation. Um, but this scale position can also be played uh, in a chromatic position on the bottom two strings if you like, and I don't have it written on the handout that way, but some people will play this starting on the third finger. So um, if you think of it this way, you actually have the ability to begin a scale on any of the fingers, although it's most normally played starting with the second finger. So to recap, with the thumb always on the harmonic, a B flat scale in chromatic position, type one, an A major scale, semi-chromatic, uh, type two scale position, type 3 position, normally a semi-chromatic position, um, starting on the second finger. But can also be started on the third finger. From here we'll move on and talk about how to start improvising using these diatonic positions um, over standard chord changes, like diatonic soloing in over standard chord changes, and discover, I think, and I hope, um, that it's a really great first step towards intuitive soloing, where you're not thinking about theory so much, where you're actually just playing from the sound. Well, at this point, having worked out the three scale positions available in thumb position, starting on any finger we like, the real fun begins because now it's time to start applying all of this stuff to me to actual music making and playing melodies and soloing which was the point of it in the first place um, so 
first thing we need to realize is that each of these positions is infinitely transposable. So we learned the type one position in B flat because we wanted to keep our thumb on the harmonics. So there's, there's our octave harmonic. We learned the type two position in A because we wanted to keep our thumb on the harmonics. And we learned the type three position in C for the same reason. But there's no reason why any of these scales can't be played in any key. Uh, since we're playing My Romance, we're going to start them each on B flat by just putting the first note of the scale, uh, putting that finger on the B flat. So type one is already in B flat. Type two was in A. We move that thumb to B flat. And it's a B flat scale. Type three position, we move that second finger to B flat. play all of them in the key of B flat. And we also learned that rather than think of the note names that we're playing, we're thinking of the scale degrees in terms of just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the scale. When we think about how to solo melodically, which I think everyone wants to be a melodic soloist, I know I do, um, the first question to ask ourselves is if we want to solo melodically, we need to do as melodies do. So what do melodies do? Many melodies, especially of Tin Pan Alley standards, uh, are largely diatonic. They come largely from within one key. The notes in them come from within one key. And even when they don't always completely do that, there are large sections in these Tin Pan Alley songs, the ones which make up a large portion of the jazz repertoire, there's large portions of these melodies where that big section of the song comes out of one diatonic key so they can be played within one position. And so when we think, how do I solo melodically? Well, the first thing to do when you're trying to solo melodically is you want to do as melodies do. If I can't put up the score on the video for copyright reasons, but if, uh, if we were to look at the score for My Romance, you would see that the key signature is the key signature of B flat. And when you look at the melody, the, the melody of the entire song is completely diatonic. There is not a note in the melody from outside the key of B flat. And so when I'm thinking, how do I solo on this song? I'm thinking, well, if I want to solo melodically, I want to do as melodies do. And the melody of this song uses only the notes of B flat. Then, then my next thought is, well, it must be possible to play a really convincing and really musical and melodic improvisation on these chord changes if that's what the melody of the song did in the first place. So how do we get started doing that? Well, to start with, um, I'm going to limit in this video, I'm going to limit the improvisations to the type one position because it's the most common position and it's the most ergonomic for the hand. So we're going to stay. largely in this position, um, but realize at the same time that everything that's going on in this position could be done equally well in the other positions as well because the same notes are there. So how do you start by improvising melodically? You know, the detractors of diatonic improvisation will say, well, people just end up wandering up and down the scale aimlessly. And certainly you will hear a lot of people do that, especially beginning improvisers, as they're just finding getting their sea legs under them when they're improvising, will tend to just kind of play up and down the scale. So how do you get started once you've got this idea of, okay, now I can, I can sing the name of a scale degree and say its number and sort of sing its number and then I can play it um, and I can learn to play melodies in that way. What is a good way to get started once I can play the melody of the song? As was played in the intro of this video, how do I then uh, begin to improvise over the changes of the song without just playing up and down the scale? Well, one really great way to do it is to embellish the melody. So you're kind of playing around the shape of the melody, you're landing on the important notes that the melody lands on, but you're, you're embellishing and ornamenting that melody as you go along, um, adding notes above and below it 
moving around it, but always coming back to that central focus of the melody. And if I were to do that for this song, My Romance, it might end up sounding something like this. And in that way, you're able to play with the diatonic notes of the key center, the notes of the scale, and you're able to sort of hear your way around the form of the song without actually just running the scale up and down. You're playing around with an existing structure. And as an example of this, uh, a much more advanced example, I'd like to go next uh, to a recording I made of this with the play-along track from the original intro of this uh, segment of uh, this video in which I went back and against that uh, piano and drum track that was on the intro I played a completely diatonic solo that I think is pretty musical um, which at some point stayed close to the notes of the melody and at other points drifted far and far away from the farther and farther away from the notes of the melody and just became their own melodic subject on their own and I'd like to cut to that now So in the last example, uh, not only were the notes completely diatonic to the key of B-flat on that uh, improvised diatonic solo, but they all came um, completely out of the type 1 scale position. So the only notes that were used were the ones that were shown in that original type 1 scale box pattern, basically. They looked like uh, it was this position, the chromatic position two notes on top which were pivoted for right they were not I didn't shift to get into them and when I got down to the low tonic or the low root of the scale I also used the root seventh sixth and fifth I used the low notes beneath that but that entire solo was made up of just that one scale position and improvising out of that scale position and one of the nice things about that, that I uh, really like soloing in that way, or at least approaching a solo from that way, is that um, I'm no longer tied to thinking of, you know, specific chord changes and thinking of a specific different scale for every chord change that comes along. I'm really thinking more along the lines of I'm improvising a melody much in the way that the melody of the song 
um, was constructed just of the notes of the scale and I'm basically playing by sound which means I can kind of shut my brain off and just listen and try and hear my way to find a good sounding note that matches the changes rather than thinking about it. As a matter of fact, as I go back and look at that uh, last um, last section of the video before the one with the play along, where I was just talking about it and played an unaccompanied uh, diatonic solo, I was kind of laughing because the first thing I saw was my eyes are rolling towards the ceiling and I looked kind of insane. It's because I was trying to get out of thinking, trying to stop thinking and eventually just ended up closing my eyes, which is what I usually do when I play, so I can uh, play more from a place of hearing a sound um, that I think will sound good against the song or against the changes of the song, rather than thinking about, okay, what note matches the, the three chord or the six chord, or you know, because that always leads me into very robotic sounding playing, so I try not to do that. So in improvising diatonically, the thing which is always my anchor all the time um, is the melody of the song. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, there's different ways of people think of songs in different ways. And some people think of when they're improvising, they're playing the changes of the song or the chord changes of the song. Uh, I always think I'm playing the song when what I'm thinking of is not the chord changes themselves, but the melody of the song primarily. So the melody is always my greatest anchor. When, when you get into examining the chord changes of a song, you'll often notice, as happens in my romance, um, that when you look at the chords that go beneath the melody, that in my romance most of them are diatonic, but some of them are not. Some of them are secondary function chords, like 5 of 2, 5 of 3, 2 5 of 3, etc., 5 of 4, and there's one sub five of five in there. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist and understand all of this stuff to get started soloing. But what that means is that there are some chords in there which do contain notes which are outside of the key. And jazz soloists often like to highlight those notes um, in their solos so that they sound more in tune with the, the specific chord changes of the song when improvising. And th it's not in the scope of this video to get into all the theory behind that. But obviously in order to do that, to play those notes that are outside the key, um, that might be in the changes, might be implied by the changes, um, you would need to be able to play the notes um, outside of just the diatonic position itself. Well, each one of these diatonic positions that we have looked at, the type 1, the type 2, and the type 3, they contain, um, on each string, um, they contain four notes within the span of a minor third or a major third. So it's very easy to get the remainder of the chromatic notes under your hand without too much finagling of the position. You can still basically stay in the position. Let's stop and do the math for a minute about a key center and see how many notes are in a key center and how many notes are left. A diatonic scale goes from one, one to eight, but eight is a repeat of one. So you go basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you've got seven different notes. And then when you get to the octave, you're repeating the first note again. The chromatic scale, as we probably know, has 12 notes. So that means we're playing seven of the um, 12 chromatic notes anytime we play a scale we're playing slightly more than half of them and so what we would want to know is where to find those other five notes should we want to play one of those notes to match the changes that we're playing and in each position there are ways to do it uh, in the in the chromatic position we're already playing chromatically on each string least we have our fingers placed so that we could play chromatically on each string. So if we're playing basically this already, all we would have to do to play a chromatic scale would be to pivot our thumb. Well, there's two ways to do it. We would either have to pivot our thumb back one half step to play a chromatic scale 
Or alternately, we could pivot our third finger forward on each string. scale. And notice that in doing that we don't really have to come out of the position that we're playing. And so when we're playing, when we start uh, after many many hours and many many years, when we start getting bored of playing largely diatonic solos and we want to start outlining those notes outside of the key that the changes imply, we can still play positionally and we can still play positionally um, out of these positions if we want. We just have to realize that in the cracks of those seven notes that constitute a scale or a tonality, a diatonic tonality, uh, are those remaining five chromatic notes. So as we said, in this position, there's your chromatic scale. In the type two position, could play those chromatic notes like that just by filling in the holes and if your line called for one of those notes it would be very easy to sort of alter your position to grab one of those notes and then go back into your diatonic position in the type 3 position it's also very easy to play a chromatic scale so, as I said, it's not in the scope of this video to talk about how to outline changes in a standard. That's for a later video in the series. But it is important for us to know that these positions are not just for diatonic soloing. They also allow us to reach all of the chromatic notes that we would need to completely outline the changes, even those changes that include notes that are outside of the key, like 502, 503, 504, 505, 506, uh, all of which uh, are in the changes to my romance and all of which will be included uh, in the PDF that you can download from my website when you're starting to think about, okay, now that I've played diatonic solos for a while, where do I find these extra chromatic notes that make so many players sound so good? They're all there in those scale positions, but you'll be able to see on the handout um, the functions of the chords of the changes to my romance um, and the ones that are marked five of or sub five of or something, those are the ones that are going to contain a note or two from outside the key. And at a later point, we can get into talking about, um, you know, how to implement those notes and how to land on the important notes of a secondary function chord and all of that. But for our purposes, we just want to know that they're there, that they are within the reach of our position, and that we don't have to leave our position to get those notes um, when the changes call for them. And I'd like to close the video uh, by playing one last performance clip. And this clip is one in which um, I played against, again, against the piano drum track that was used on the intro and then again on the last uh, segment where I did a diatonic solo, where I play a more bebop-ish solo which outlines the changes and which outlines a lot of those secondary dominant function chords in the changes to my romance. Uh, including all of those chromatic notes that uh, are involved in those secondary function chords. I, I uh, basically play a solo that's more bebop-ish, that uses those notes outside the key, but without straying too far from the position, um, the basic position that the solo came from. And so I'm basically in this last track, I'm coming from, um, I'm coming from the type 1 position. And I'm using some of these chromatic notes. I'm using at some point the B natural to lead to the C. I'm using a C sharp to lead to the D. I'm using an E natural to lead to the F. I use a, an A flat to lead down to the G. Um, and I may be leaving a note out, but I can't remember. Um, but in any case, on that example, all 12 chromatic notes are used, and, um, and, and but I didn't have to ever leave the position in order to use them. So I'd like to close the video with that. Be sure to check out the PDF from my website, and thank you for joining me for this installment.